welcome to the, uh, uh, the last bit of the course. Of, um, so we're going to tie up everything. To, uh, we're going to discuss these four things. Can you believe it's September? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, feels like March. Um, but uh, so, all right. So uh, transformers, uh, that it, it, we have one key equation we'll need to learn today. I'll pop this up here first so um, you know what to expect. Uh, so this is the main part. And there's also the uh, latter part. And uh, P and the S stands for primary and secondary. Okay. Um, so I'll just put this right here first right off the bat. Okay, and um, yeah, uh, I'll explain what these things mean in the uh, as we go. Also, I uh, one extra term. Um, I really, due to the shortness of the course, I really don't have time to do justice. But uh, hopefully, you see the idea of electromagnets is a really big deal in just real life. So um, I think I, I've gave you a couple, like three or four applications, including the northern lights or uh, velocity and mass spectrometers and um, stuff, but, or and even I casually mentioned picking up trash, picking up metallic trash to to recycle. Um, uh, for recycling, you know, to, to recycle uh, um, or metals or any copper, you know, uh, you can make a magnet of that. But there's just everyday life. Uh, if you use some imagination and um, after the uh, course, uh, look around yourself, you can, you can see a lot of things used as electromagnet. This is just another example from a textbook about um, bells, about doorbells or any electronic bells. Um, you can have a spring load over here so that, uh, so that it's, it's trying to pull the rod back and this iron rod will, um, it's, going to be stick in here. But uh, as soon as you hit the switch, you close the switch, this generates a magnet. If it is an iron, it will immediately suck it into the magnet because this is a neutral piece of iron. And then if you create a magnetic field here, it will go against the spring and then um, suck it into here and ring the bell. Right. So many, many applications as we see. All right. So let's start. Uh, first thing is, uh, let me tie the, together the two laws we learned yesterday into one. You can sort of combine them and write them in, in one single line like this. So there's Faraday's law, which tells us if you have a rate of change, if you have a change in magnetic flux, you will get an induced EMF. Okay? And the induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change of flux. So the faster you change the flux um, and the more dramatic you change the flux, you'll get a larger potential difference in your loop. Um, just a recap of the theory, you can, you can make a loop like this, right? Um, but let's, now that you've understand the basic, I'll make it a little bit more realistic. Um, so the loop is not a complete loop, but it actually spins off um, uh, so that the current have a chance to flow in and out of the loop. You place that inside some magnetic field. It's not a good blue. So you put it in some magnetic field like this, which can easily be made out of a north and south pole of magnet and uh, connect the rest over here to, let's say, a light bulb or a capacitor if you want to store the electricity or just any appliance, right? So you have a area here, um, let's say, uh, so yeah, so, so the, there's actually flux going through it, right? So um, the magnetic flux, as we introduced last time, is defined as basically B times A, but it, you have to take into account of the angle as well, right? So this is identical. Either way, these two are completely identical ways of writing things. Um, it's, so either way is fine. Okay, this is more elegant from a mathematical point of view, obviously. Um, but yeah, if you want to make it simpler, that's what it means, right? It takes into account of the angle because if the, if the plane, if there's no field actually, if it's oriented at an angle that there's no field going through it, there's no flux going through the loop. So if you are able to change either the angle, the area, or the magnetic field strength, remember B without the vector sign stands for magnetic field strength, like electric field strength, right? The magnitude of it. As long as you're able to make one of any one of these or all three, but just to keep your life simple, right? time dependent so that it actually changed either this or uh, the, a, the area that it cuts through or changes as a function of time or the um, angle changes as a function of time, anything changes as a function of time, you will be able to set up a potential difference across the one point and another point. So as far as the light bulb is concerned, it almost thinks that it is connected to a battery. Okay. It's almost thinks that it's connected to battery. Um, I will draw it like this uh, because in, in a moment I'll explain um, whether it thinks it's an AC battery or a DC battery, an AC power source or a DC power source. Right? But as, as far as it's concerned, um, as long as you are able to change the flux inside here, if you're able to make the flux change as a function of time, then you'll be able to provide um, a potential difference, an induced EMF. It's almost like a battery, but it's induced from here. Right? As soon as you have induced EMF, then um, you can calculate the current. Remember, the current is always most dependent on whatever you put in the circuit. The more resistance you put in the circuit, the smaller the current will be. The current is very dependent on how much resistance you will apply in your circuit. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So, so that's Faraday's law. Lenz's law tells you that which direction it goes. Right. So Lenz's law tells you the direction of the uh, induced B field um, that comes from the induced uh, EMF or induced current. 
right, will always oppose the change in the external flux, in the external flux. Okay. So if, if you suddenly, let's say at first there's no flux going through, you turn off the B field completely and then you slowly uh, increase the B field. So you gradually turn it on. So the flux through the area, I, this is not very 3D like, but hope, uh, assume it's the, the area is perpendicular to the field. Right? So, so um, now you gradually turn on the B field so the flux increases. What the direction of the current, so does it flow this way or that way, right? So it will, the lens law basically is an observation. Remember law is just historical observation facts that people don't know how to explain it, right? Um, uh, the, it is observed by lens that it will go in a way that whatever the induced B field, right? So you'll get an induced current or induced EMF, right? It will, it will generate an in, in, any current will on itself to so distinguish what is external and what is sort of induced out of it. So as soon as you have a current, you'll get an induced um, current out of it uh, that will um, that, that that will create an induced B field that opposes that change. So if the external flux gets larger, it will generate a way that it opposes it. Um, if the external flux gets smaller, it will try to go in a way, um, it will, the current will go in a way that supports it, okay? Because the whole idea is, um, think of it as uh, electromagnetic inertia. Do you guys know what inertia means? Um, pop in the chat uh, if anyone doesn't know what inertia means. Okay, inertia in short, inertia is the resistance to change. Um, so when you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed and you don't want to, that's inertia. <laughs> um, more physics wise is uh, uh, if you have an object over here, it, 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 if it's not moving, it, it wants to stay at rest, right? It doesn't spontaneously move. Also, inertia applies to moving objects. Newton first law basically tells us if you have something that is moving at a constant velocity, it doesn't want to change either, right? It's almost like if you're doing, um, if you're in the workout and you're in the zone, you don't want to change, you want to keep going on. So that, that is inertia, so like um, momentum. Um, in fact, uh, inertia, believe it or not, it's one of the deepest mysteries in physics. We still don't know why things have inertia, like why things don't want to change. Right? So what I described is mechanical inertia and a little bit about psychological inertia in our life. Um, but uh, the first one about uh, objects want to maintain its motion or uh, whether it's at rest or maintain its velocity, that's mechanical inertia. And then there's the um, electromagnetic inertia. So electromagnetism has inertia as well. So at first, um, let's say you don't have any B field going through it. So there's no flux going through it. Um, then the, the wire is completely happy. It's completely satisfied with no B field going through it. Now, when you suddenly increase the B field, it becomes very unhappy, it becomes very uneasy. And it tries to create a current so that it creates a, its own B field, right? It's induced B field to try to oppose whatever's going on. In the second case, so that's case one. In the second case, if I decrease the B field, external B field, so the flux, let's say originally there's a lot, like now, now that the, the wire is all caught up, <laughs> um, it has the B field going through and it is okay, finally settled in the zone of, okay, I have a B field going through me, all right, that's good. Um, now you suddenly decrease it, it doesn't like that as well. It's tries, it will try to create a current that maintains the amount of B field. So let's say this is, uh, the B field is pointing to the right, um, which I guess to, with the zoom flip, it's gonna be that way. <laughs> um, so uh, if, the cur uh, if the field is going to the right and suddenly you turn off the B field or you turn it off very slowly, right, gradually turn it off, the wire is not going to be happy and it's going to create an induced current that makes its own B field to the right to, to maintain its original um, amount of magnetic fields in that way, right? So that is that. So now uh, people can sort of combine these two ideas of uh, Faraday law addressing what is the magnitude of the, um, so you can calculate the induced current out of this, the magnitude of the induced EMF or the induced uh, current, um, it's basically proportional to this, um, whatever constant you, uh, it, uh, it's basically um, due to convention. Um, however, it's actually easier just to make it one. Uh, um, you can define, basically that defines what Tesla, the unit of Tesla is. And uh, this is Lenz law on this side, right? So the Lenz law addresses the fact that whatever induced is opposing the external. So people just combine it in one sentence with a minus sign over there. The minus sign is not taken that seriously. There's no sense of sort of negative uh, magnitude. It's really just a mnemonic to remind ourselves that um, the direction of the induced current is in such a way that it ex opposes whatever is the external change in B field. Okay. Uh, question clarifying that not a negative in front of the ex uh, external. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in fact, I just uh, addressed this. So, yeah. So that negative has no calculational significance, no algebraic significance. It's really to encapsulate this idea together. Um, so this people will quote it as Faraday lens law, just to get us, right? So one ingredient addresses the magnitude of this and one ingredient addresses the direction of this. All right, um, 
which should bring us to uh, AC generators. Let's uh, analyze a little bit more um, how power plants work. So if I have a magnet like this, right, going from north to south, and I put a, uh, this time I put a square loop through it, so it's a little bit easier. So this is the top view. Um, but it's probably easier to look at it from the side. Maybe I'll use a separate page. So if I look at it from the side, from the side view, um, the, let's say the, um, the loop, the current loop, right? So you're looking from the side like this, is like this. Sort of the plane of the loop is parallel to the B field, okay? So at first, what is the flux going through this loop? Can someone tell me what is the flux going through this loop? Let's say this is initially, and then now you flip it up. What is the flux through uh, case number one? Very good, zero. So if the uh, loop is in the plane of the field, no field is actually cutting through it, right? Remember the word cutting is sometimes we use that as a metaphor uh, for it. And now you rotate it. So I'm rotating it like this, right? So the first step, I'll rotate it 90 degrees. Now there's a huge flux through it, right? So at first in state one, there's zero. And then now uh, if it's 90 degrees, um, say state number two is B times A, simply B times A, A, A is the area of this loop, right? Um, you, so technically, um, right, this is B A cos theta. And what, what's changing is B is not changing, A is not changing, it's, it's the theta, uh, the, the angle between them that is changing. Um, in terms of area vector, you can also account for that, right? This is the original area vector, A1. And uh, in, in uh, case number two, right, after you rotate it, this is the area vector. It's a perpendicular vector this way. So at first you see it is the B vector is just constant, right? and it's just going, doing its thing, going from left to right. Um, at first, uh, A1 is perpendicular to this. So with the cosine, um, it's going to be zero. And then here with the cosine, it's going to be one. Right? So now you've got an increase in flux. Right? So what happens? Right? So in this process, the flux increases, which means there will be an induced current. Right. So you have an induced current uh, will flow, and uh, so it will flow. And which way will it flow? It will flow in a way that opposes the increasing flux. So it will try to flow in a way um, that decreases the flux. So um, if I use um, green, right? Now, the, so remember, at first, there's no flux going through it. Now, there's flux going through it to the right. It's not going to be happy. So it is going to try to create its own B field, B induced that opposes the external B field. This is the B vector, external. Right. And how, uh, which way does this loop have to, um, does the current have to go in order to create this green B field? It must, um, with your right hand, so it must go, uh, the, the current must go in here and out here, right? It must rotate in this direction. Okay. So if you're, Again, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise depends on which way you're looking at. You're looking from the left or looking from the right. Let's say you're looking in from the right, from the south pole direction, then it's going to go um, clockwise, right? like that. Yeah. But it's easier to just mark uh, where it's going in and where it's going out. And then now, as you keep turning it, let's say you turn it another 90 degrees, so back to state three, there's no um, flux again. Now the flux decreases in this step, right? The flux decreases. So the current, again, um, you will get a, as long as the flux change, as long as you have some change in uh, flux, you will get a current. But with this time, it will go in a way that supports the external field, right? Because it, it's decreasing and it's not happy. It wants to, it wants to maintain that. So it's going to go in a way that um, supports the, the external field, right? Um, because it wants to oppose the decrease in external field, right? So it's going to generate its own uh, B field. So let me use yellow this time. Um, so this time, as, as it goes, um, as it as it tilts sort of uh, halfway, maybe let's draw a new one, goes from here to here, and ultimately to here, um, but it's easy to just draw it halfway first. Um, it wants to create a field in, in this direction, right? Um, the, but it's tilted, so it has to create a uh, induced field in this direction, but it, it wants a component, right, that uh, the X component to to be in support of the external field like that. Okay. Um, because if it, if it induces something like this, um, this component doesn't help the external field at all, but now this component is just opposing it. So that's not the right way. Right. So it wants to create a B field in this way so that it supports the decrease in flux. Right. So how do you achieve that? Then you need to um, have the field go uh, in here 
and so right in here and out of here right you agree in order to induce a b field that points this way right because the external flux is going to decrease as it goes from here to here so notice the current changes sign the induced current flips before the top was uh in and here is out now this is in this is uh, out so um you what you see is, is as you rotate this if you have a if you have your pet um cow uh tied and ask your cow to walk in a circle and 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 get this spinning or the current you produce with half of it will be going one way and then the second half of the rotation will be going down another way right so what type of currents are you producing direct or alternating you produce an alternating current right so that's why most power plants you see today generates alternating current that goes into your household right so um remember this is the flux um, formula and uh if you differentiate that with respect to time you'll get something like this now this is just how fast it is rotating right it's the amount of angle per unit time so this is called angular speed angular velocity or angular speed or velocity now let's say it rotates you know at um at 30 degrees per second it's like that you know that can be a constant unless your cow starts speeding up and slowing down let's say your cow is well trained and it's going in this constant speed or you have you put this under a water mill or a windmill that is spinning at a constant rate it doesn't have to be constant but just for simplicity let's say that's constant the only thing that is changing so that's usually called uh, omega um, some professors used to joke the difference between going to a college and a community college is in one you call this w and the other you call it omega so that's where your money's worth is <laughs> uh, so you have uh, e a omega sine so everything here is a constant. The only thing that depends on the time is this. So you see, what is the, if I try to plot the um, induced um, EMF, it's going to look like this right, in the sine curve. Uh, so the flux through it, you see um, the flux follows here, the external flux through it follows a cosine like this. Right? So at first the flux is, um, well, it depends on where you start. Uh, if you start off at uh, here, then it's going to be zero. So maybe I should shift it. But anyway, maybe this is 0.2, and then here is 0.3, right? So let's say this at that point, the the included angle between the a vector and the b vector is zero, right? So here, the included angle between it, the angle included angle is a function of time. It's zero degrees. Here it's 90 degrees. Uh, here is 180 degrees, yeah, 270, and 360 degrees, right? The whole rotation. How does that map over here? So at first here, you will, uh, this is the induced current or induced EMF, right? The, the relationship between this is just by a factor of R. Um, so uh, if one is, if one is goes as long as a sine, the other is also a sine, right? If one is cosine, the other is also cosine. Right. So um, you see the first 180 degrees. So from this point to this point, uh, it will, the, the current is flowing in one way. The current is flowing in, in the positive direction um, and the other is flowing in the other way, right? So that's why you get that alternating current. So you get alternating current or AC. Okay. So uh, you can see this is the diagram, right? You, uh, in, also, you want to include some slip rings over here. So remember, this side is completely connected to this ring. So as you rotate it, uh, this ring rotates with this wire. And uh, the other wire over here connects to this slip ring. So as it rotates, these rings rotate as well. Um, and this is not touching, right? The, the, the inner ring is just connected to one side of the wire. So yeah, so it will produce a current going this way and then half of it will produce a current going the other way. You will get alternating current and a typical um, generator rotates around 50 to 60 Hertz, which means it flips around uh, 50 to 60. Actually it doubles because um, uh, um, because you see, uh, in one uh, complete rotation, um, right, sorry, uh, the, the current flips that much, but if you analyze the power going through the bulb, right, that's the current through the bulb and uh, voltage through the bulb, sorry, voltage across the bulb. So if you have this uh, generator over here and you have a bulb over here, what really you what you really care is not really which way the current goes or the uh, potential difference, even though let's say this is the induced EMF from your generator. So this is the same as what you experience in the bulb. Um, what you care is the, um, because this flips back and forth, this flips back and forth, it's very difficult to analyze both at the same time. So let's rearrange it in another way that is easier to understand um, because the resistance of the bulb is always constant. That's to do with the material, right? So you need to square it. So that means uh, if you square it, if you get a, 
if you if this is following a sign, right, you square it, it will look like this. So in 360 degrees, it actually flips up and down twice. Okay? So you actually get 120 hertz. Right? You don't need to really know these numbers, but just to get, give you an idea of the number in real life, um, how, how much it flips back and forth. So if you look at any light bulbs, they actually flip around this much um, uh, from 100 to 1 per second. That many times uh, per second goes sort of on and off. So uh, our eyes don't really catch that. It's impossible to catch that. Um, it, to give you a reference, right? If you watch a movie, movies are filmed in 24 frames per second, so that's 24 hertz. Um, already, you look at, you watch a YouTube video. Um, YouTube videos are around like 30 hertz. Um, if anyone's into video editing, um, you might know these numbers. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so you already think that's continuous motion. So with 100 hertz, that's you just think that the light is completely turned on. Right, so this is the P max. What you sort of get is the a P average over here because. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. So what you really get out of it is p average. So to be a little bit more technical, it's, you're actually getting the root mean square average of it. Um, but that's a little bit beyond our syllabus. But so just get a rough idea of what, how this works. Now a DC generator needs to be a little bit more clever if you don't want this to go on and off, like it sort of flip the current back and forth. Then what you want is to sort of split this ring in half. So um, the moment it goes, start going the other way, when the current starts flowing the other way uh, because of the induction uh, of the electromagnetic induction, um, then this will flip the uh, this will, this will connect to the other side, so it flips it back. So what you get is instead of a induced current that goes like this, it will, because of the connection, it will bump whatever, yeah, because it, it will flip it to the other side as well. So now your current is only flowing one way. It will still, it will still go from high to low, high to low like this, that you cannot prevent, right? Because it's a cosine uh, feature of the, of the thing, right? Yeah, so, so yeah. Um, so that's how you make an AC generator. That's how you make a DC generator. What does this have to do with transformers? Um, now, let's put this together. Uh, let's say I have a coil, which I'll call the primary coil. And I'm going to put a secondary coil, let's use orange, right through it with different number of turns. Okay, so the primary coil has n uh, p number of turns and the secondary coil has an s amount of turns. Okay, I'll overlap them together. Now here, let's uh, turn on, put it, to a, put it to a battery and turn this on, okay? And as soon as you turn it on, right, remember you will get a magnetic field going through it. Right? So um, depending on the direction I draw, I'll just make it simpler. I, I'm not sure if I've drawn it the right way, but you, you get the idea. You'll get a magnetic field going through here, so technically it wraps around as well. For now, let's forget about the edge effects. We'll focus on in the middle because that's what the, the orange one, the secondary one experience as a flux. Right. So if you turn it on, it, uh, at first, uh, step number one, um, there's no flux through the orange one. Right. And then step number two, when you turn it on, now there is a flux through it. So there is a change in flux. Right. So what will happen? You'll be able to induce a current through here. Again, I don't know which way is supposed correct, but um, yeah, you'll get the idea that it'll um, just as a... I don't want to draw the direction. I don't want to commit myself to the direction. Um, so you, from step one to step two, you will get an induced current. Okay. Now, how much current will you get? Well, for one loop, you will. So for each loop, you will get this much. Right? Depends on how much the flux changes per unit time. From the from so this is from B one times the area two, right? Uh, I've made it so that they are, the area and it's always, the flux is always crossing it at 90 degrees. So it's just B times A. But the B actually comes from, from, uh, from one, right? One is controlling the B field. And the orange one, the secondary one, is just experiencing the B field created by the electromagnet of number one. Okay, so that's why I'm coloring it this way. Right? But if you have NS number of loops, then the total you experience is going to be that much, right, of a single loop. Right, so an S amount, right? So you're going to experience this much. Again, remember the flux is from number one times the area of two. Um, and also, uh, how about uh, how about B one? Well, what is B one? B one is uh, treat this as a very long solenoid, right? treat it as an infinite solenoid. Then you will get mu naught n uh, i, which is mu naught n primary over the length of the primary coil, right? The current of the primary coil, right? That's the amount of magnetic field, right? So uh, you can see that the larger the NS, the larger the potential difference you can generate out of two, total out of two, out of the secondary coil, okay? 
So it, whatever voltage you start over here, let's call that V1. I rarely write things without a delta, but this is an exception because the formula looks slightly more elegant. But, um, you can create actually a different voltage out of here, right? Uh, you can call it primary and secondary or one and two, or whatever, right? So what is the ratio? Um, I, because this is a beginner's course, I won't derive it, to, it for you, but you can go through the math and then you can figure out this is the ratio that comes out. So if you have, let's say, a thousand turns in the secondary coil, and let's say you have 10 turns in the primary coil, then you can actually increase the, so you can increase the second voltage 100 times of the first primary voltage. So this is called a transformer. It's a device that allows you, the wording is called stepping up or stepping down. It basically allows you to, a device to increase or decrease. So it's called stepping up or step down the voltages. So whatever you create, you can create, start with something with um, five volts. Let's say you start with something with five volts, buy a battery and then put it, um, run it through a transformer and you can get 500 volts out of this. So this is a very interesting device. So a little bit more realistic ones. Um, don't sort of overlap them like this because it's, um, uh, th there's a better way to do it. Um, that's an engineering problem that we won't go through it too much. But what you want to do is um, put a piece of iron over here like this. So this is just some uh, iron or some metal. Because in one side, when you create the um, magnetic fields, the iron will actually guide them along here and sort of reduce the edge effects and sort of contain everything in here. So the magnetic field goes through like this. And um, the magnetic field will try, there will be some leakage outside here, but if you have a piece of metal, um, the metal atoms, again, this is like beyond our syllabus, but you can sort of intuitively imagine that the, the atoms in the metal will sort of just force the field to go along with it. So you can put it like this, all right? And notice what type of input do you need? You have to do a alternating current input. You cannot use a DC input. Because if you have a DC input, the moment you turn it on, yes, there's a change in flux, right? Because this side is going to be connected to a light bulb or something, right? This side is going to be your generator. If you use a, if you use a, a DC one, the moment you turn it on, good, there's a change in flux. It went from nothing, no flux, to lots of flux. But DC will start to make a, make a constant field. It's not going to change. So you need an AC so that um, your current here goes back and forth, right? The current here changes, which means your magnetic field goes back and forth, which means your flux through the number two, right, the, the flux through number two is going to change in time. So the current has a fighting chance, right? The EMF has a fighting chance to get induced some current or EMF on this side, right? So as you can see, this is another reason why AC is so much more useful in the real world, even though at first when you learn about it, it looks very flip floppy <laughs> going back and forth, but this is the important part. All right. Um, also, uh, but what's it, at first you might think like, wow, am I getting uh, power for free? Because if I can increase my voltage, it looks like for every second, remember power is uh, energy per unit time, right? For every second, I'm going to get more energy uh, if I can increase this. Um, that's not true <laughs> because um, if you think carefully, uh, the, what happens is when the voltage increases, there is a conservation of energy. The, the current is going to be smaller this way. Okay, so there's a, a conservation of energy. To, um, uh, so uh, I, I1, V1 has to equal to I2, or I primary, V primary has to equal to I secondary, V secondary. So um, if you have VP, Vs over Vp, and um, rearrange this, you can see that this is inversely related this way. So this is called the um, transformer equation, or equation for, for transformers. Okay, um, usually I will rearrange it this way because um, usually we're more interested in the voltage. But just understand uh, the other part is due to conservation of energy or conservation of power. Um, uh, to no, so there might there could be a question to ask you um, if I give you how many turns over here, how many turns? Um, what is the new current? Then you use this side. If it asks you for the new voltage, you use this side. Okay. Now uh, this brings us to um, power lines. How do power lines work? And you probably have seen these danger signs and tell you that whenever you have uh, these transmission lines. Um, they are high voltage, right? They'll say like danger, it's a high voltage. So what's happening is in a power plant, you, you generate power and what they do is they step it up uh, extremely, to extremely high voltage and then step it back down um, uh, on this side, use a step down transformer. So you just have to, um, oh uh, yeah, I should mention, um, so obviously if you want a, a step, 
up transformer is when V secondary is larger than the V primary, right? The step down is when V secondary is smaller than the primary. Okay, uh, that, that also means that you need the number of coils uh, to be larger in the secondary or the number of coils to be smaller in the secondary if you want to step it down. Okay. So that's sort of the condition to, uh, to create whether a stepped up or a step down transformer. So um, yeah, so this is the, and then you step it down back to 240 because most appliances work well in 240, okay? Um, in fact, you're, uh, so you might be curious, why, uh, why do we want to step it up? There's two reasons. Number one, it's actually safer. And number two, it's more efficient. Okay. Power efficient. Now, it might seem counterintuitive for the safer because you see all these dangerous signs saying that um, there's danger, it's high voltage. But uh, you might be glad to know that high voltage is safer than high current. Um, remember, there's a conservation over here, right? So you can, if, no matter how, if, if the power plant, power produced, is certain amount, if you step this up, this will go down, right? If you step this down, this will go up. So um, you, you can't get more power out of whatever power plant you create. Um, it's just a choice of, do you want to make it, it, when you transmit it, do you want to transmit it with a high voltage and low current or a low, a low voltage and high current? Um, there's, a say, there's a saying, say, uh, voltage shocks, but current jo uh, jolts, I think. I might have to Google that. <laughs> voltage shocks. Oh, current kills. Um, what, uh, because what's, if you touch it, I'm not going to go through too much of the biology here. Um, first of all, I'm not an expert, but uh, uh, you can, it'll also short on time. So you can uh, Google uh, a little bit more understanding of that. Um, if you have a high current going through your body, um, it, it, that is very fatal. It will, basically your heart also works with electric current. So if you have high current going through it, you disrupt that completely and you stop your heart. Now voltages, if you have, if you have 240 volts, um, so if you're touching, um, uh, um, yeah, so, if you are um, standing here and you touch both sides and you have a potential difference across you like this with 240 volts, but you only have like 0 0.1 amps going through you, it, it might be a little bit painful, but it does it, this, what, what stops your heart is this, okay? Um, this will probably create pain. <laughs> that will, that, that's why you'll get a huge shock. But um, if you have a low current, imagine if you have, if you have a very, very low current, um, that's not gonna do much to you, right? It, um, yeah, so, so that's one reason why you want to reduce the current. It's actually for safety, right? It might be highly painful. Actually, if it's that high, it'll probably burn you alive as well. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but still, at least it doesn't stop your heart. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and you step it down, it's a 240, you know, it's somewhat safer there. All right. But more importantly, that's not really the main reason, although that's one reason. Um, th this is the main reason for power efficiency. So every line has some sort of resistance, right? E every real wire is not ideal. They will have some sort of resistance. All right, so resistance of the line. So what do you want to do? So you want to minimize the power consumed, the power loss, right? The power consumed in the lines. Well, that's to do with the current of the line and the voltage of the, the potential difference between um, this side and this side, right? Um, we don't really know what this is of the lines. Um, so let's rewrite it in this way. Then I do know what, um, I do know what uh, this is, right? This is some sort of number. So if you want to reduce, so what you want is to minimize the power consumed or power lost in the lines. To minimize that, you basically want to minimize the current. Okay? So this is why we prefer extremely high voltage through the two points, um, and reduce the currents. Okay, all right. Um, so th uh, this is pretty much it. Um, although I'm running as a little bit, um, I want to end with a little bit of um, history of this as well. It, it's a very important phase of history that I think um, uh, I sh really should bring it up. It's later on now. It's co uh, coined the War of the Currents or the Currents War. It's really the struggle between AC and DC. How many of you heard of Thomas Edison? Okay, actually, maybe I'll put it in the new slide. How many of you heard of Thomas Edison? And how many of you learned that he was a hero <laughs> in elementary school or something like that? And if you know the actual history behind it, this is one of the biggest complete, excuse my language, complete BS in the history of science. Um, <laughs> 
Edison is probably the probably the most overrated um, scientist or uh, um, engineer in in the modern history of science. Um, he, what basically he did was um, there's a huge competition when all these were new between AC and DC. When all these theories were new, um, uh, t basically Thomas Edison um, was one of the first person who made a DC generator. Um, so uh, uh, he was a big champion of this side of of the the story and uh, Tesla invented a lot of Nicholas Tesla um, invented a lot of the uh, he invented first AC generator etc so which one's better for the world well um, well you probably know the answer here now <laughs> and um, given uh, yeah, uh, what we live in uh, but uh, back then they, they don't know um, Yes, he did. Uh, so the, the prob if you know, want to know a little bit of background, Tesla is a, uh, comes from not a rich family, um, probably a middle class family. He has some amount of money, but most of his inventions, he's basically an inventor um, at heart, a scientist and an inventor at heart. Um, and he just he, he found a lot of uh, people to fund him to do his research and stuff like that. And uh, He's very accurately described as inventor more. Um, whereas Edison is basically, he came from a, a upper class family. It has the richest background. Um, if you ever heard in elementary school, how you know, we, 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 they, they rate him as a, as a hero of, um, of, um, of inventing the light bulb, which is true. He did invent the light bulb, that's good. Um, and it, we're praising his uh, work et, um, ethnic of uh, trying again and again. Um, that is true, that is all, that is all good. Um, uh, but you might ask, where does, how did he get like that thousand number of light bulbs to start with? That's because he was extremely rich. He came from a huge family. He has lots of corporate ties. Um, and uh, as, they, as they mature and then they develop their own company, um, Tesla has its own lab, Edison has its own General Electric company. Um, uh, he, so he tried to, um, of course, champion his own theory, which is fine. Um, well, there's also incident that uh, Tesla actually went to work for him for a while, and then uh, Edison didn't pay him at all and, um, and, and stole all his invention. But uh, the worst part is, um, as the world starts to see more and more benefit with the AC, first of all, as I mentioned, if to, to use a transformer, you have to use AC. DC, if, if you use DC, you have to keep switching the, flip on, the switch on and off to create a changing flux, right? Because DC doesn't change, right? AC changes completely all the time, like that. So as the world starts to see that AC is more useful, um, he saw a big threat to his company. And uh, he has all his rich friends, including JP Morgan, was one of his uh, greatest friends, closest friend. Um, and uh, they, part they partnered together and figured out so many, so many ways to discredit like, uh, Tesla. Oh, Tesla was um, Austrian-American. He was born in Austria. Um, he was an immigrant, moved to America, um, had a lot of opportunity and invent a lot of things. Um, but uh, there's this huge wealth of funds, of money come, uh, going against him. And, um, and uh, Edison also has so many marketing campaigning against it. Um, the electrocuting elephant is actually one of the um, really brutal things that he did. He, uh, Took, it went on basically campaigning that AC is extremely dangerous. Um, and because with DC, he created all these little uh, batteries, you know, it doesn't seem to hurt anyone. But with AC, you can step it up and down and then it seems very dangerous. So the public was very easy to be convinced that AC was uh, uh, very dangerous um, because they heard of AC killing people, electrocuting people, um, but they never heard of a dry battery <laughs> like this to, uh, killing people. Although if you create a lot of power, you can, right? but that's not being uh, advertised. So. On the streets, uh, he, 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 he went and uh, actually publicly electrocuted elephants in the streets to demonstrate to the people of New York or, or in America that how dangerous AC can be. So he uses AC and uh, with the help of all his rich friends, it passes a law in the Supreme Court to allow people electrocutions in America to be conducted with AC, although you can do it with DC. Um, so all the electrocutions uh, back then were done in AC and everyone was completely scared of AC. Um, and it still didn't quite work and they actually hired a, a lot of um, gangsters and mafia um, and actually go and loot and uh, completely destroy Tesla's lab um, and set his lab on fire until a point that he actually almost had to leave America. Um, and at the end, he was so discredited that uh, Tesla died alone um, in some rundown apartment in New York, completely broke. Um, one of the huge tragedy, I think uh, the story of Tesla is one of the um, biggest tragedy uh, in, in uh, the history of science or modern history of science. Um, if you like, uh, there's a documentary called The War of the Currents. Um, uh, you can, or I think there's lots of documentaries about this period. You can look up some of the history in whatever uh, streaming service and Netflix or Curiosity Stream or whatever um, to find out more. Um, it is a very interesting piece of history. I won't go on too long, but um, yeah. Uh, of course, nowadays you recognize uh, which one is more useful. By the way, uh, Edison's idea of, to electrify um, America, his idea was this, because you cannot step it up or down, what you need is in every household, I should put it on this side, and the elephant on this side. And every household, he proposed people would 
um, by an Edison General Electric uh, generator. And every part of our house will have our own generator. And as a result, he can sell a lot of these and he can earn a lot of money because of this, right? Um, it, Tesla's idea was to have one central power, power, power plant to generate electricity. I know, crazy idea. <laughs> generate electricity and step it up and down and transfer it um, to households um, free of charge. Uh, and Edison was extremely scared of this idea. How on earth are you, will anyone buy a DC generators after this? His company will go broke if people are used. He cannot imagine how you can make a profit. Maybe he probably would be kinder to Tesla if he found out how to make a profit. Um, nowadays, we found out a way to do that. But he couldn't imagine back then how can you charge people if you were just sending them power. Um, you're creating power over here and sending them that way. Um, that's one of the reasons he was so adamant in um, uh, getting Tesla out of the way, which is a huge shame. Tesla's one of the smartest guys, um, the inventor. Um, he actually tried to, uh, one last thing, I promise. <laughs> he tried to make Tesla coils, if you heard of these, in a power plant and completely get rid of power grids and just have coils over here so that you can send power wirelessly to every house in America. If he's still alive, I don't know if he can make that a reality, but you can get Wi-Fi and you basically invented Wi-Fi um, and wireless charging to every household, um, at least the idea of it, uh, before he was able to make that a reality. Um, there's so many inventions, you should look it up and I'm not gonna to, so spend too much time, but it's a great shame that he died. Um, I don't know what age he died, but pretty early because of uh, a lot of disease and stuff um, of this tragic story. All right, um, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed uh, all of this. And now I will go into, help you guys to uh, solve um, some of top, get you prepared with topic test five. I'll go through as much problems as possible. All right. <laughs>